Okay. Next up, we have David Bryan talking about reducing the risks to VoIP, uh, after which we're going to be taking an uh, intermission for lunch. That will run until 2. All right. All right, thank you. I, I'm David Bryan, and I probably will grab this microphone. All right, so uh, essentially, um, I'm going to be talking about reducing the risk to your VoIP deployment. Um, kind of talk about, do a quick intro of myself, what I do, um, some of the technologies that are out there in the environments that are either you know open source or proprietary, um, a business case for why to do VoIP, I mean, it, it is a good thing. Um, some of the tools that are out there to break the VoIP connections, voice over IP. And uh, now, uh, let me clarify, when I say VoIP, I'm not saying Vonage. I'm saying a network protocol that lives on your corporate network for doing voice over that corporate IP network. Um, some of the threats that, are, that come with those tools and the risks that they pose to your environment. Uh, we'll do a quick demo and we'll talk about countermeasures and ways that you can actually reduce that risk um, to an acceptable level. So, and kind of a conclusion as to, you know, about the VoIP environment. Um, I'm David Bryan, AKA Video Man, um, a hacker, technology enthusiast, enthusiast consultant, uh, CISSP, not that that means a lot, but um, been involved in, since DEF CON 6, uh, and now I do the firewall and network design. Um, I like beer, uh, I brew my own beer, I bike, I play with electronics, um, ham radio operator too, and then I, I work for a security consulting company in Minneapolis called NetSpy. They were kind enough to you know, pay me to come out here and speak for you guys. So, All right, so some of the technologies that are out there. Um, you've got SIP, you've got, which is Session Initiation Protocol. It's a very common standard. It either goes over TCP or UDP, um, depending on how you want to do the setup. Um, it, it doesn't, well, I'm not going to get into it. But um, there's also Inter Asterisk Exchange, which is written by the authors of Asterisk. Uh, it's another protocol that's meant to sort of uh, be a little bit better at, at traversing NATed networks. Um, there's Nortels, which is a Unistim. It's Unified Networks IP Stimulus. It's a proprietary protocol. It's, it, it's very similar, in my opinion, to the way that SIP has, has been created. Um, but, it, I mean, so it uses two different channels for call setup and, and the data itself. And then there's, of course, the Cisco protocols, the MGCP, Media Gateway uh, Control Protocol, and the, the skinny SCCP uh, clients that Cisco has come out with. And then 3Com has their own proprietary one as well. Um, so one of the things that, that sort of the business case behind doing voice over IP is that it can share the infrastructure, share your resources. I mean, this is a great thing. Now it reduces your cost in deployment, right? All right. Um, uh, for example, a small 25-person phone system can be deployed in about 6 to 12K. That's just for the hardware, and there's some labor that's involved with that as well. But on the other side, there's actually the, the 3Com system. Um, I've known a deployment where it's about 30 grand, and that includes the labor to do a 25-person office. That's kind of expensive as compared to these other you know, open source type solutions. Um, another benefit of some of the voice technologies like SIP you can do trunks across the WAN and the MAN, and that allows you to do some of your least cost routing across network links that you're already paying for. So, pre, you know, in a previous world, you had to buy a PRI or you had to buy a DS3, and then that was strictly dedicated for your voice channels and your voice traffic. Well, now you can route that same voice network over the you know, existing network connectivity that you're already paying for between your enterprise environments. So, um, <coughs> Oh, geez. Offers uh, additional features such as soft phones. I mean, you, you know, in some cases, it might be nice for a traveling salesman to be able to call back into the head office without having to actually pick up their cell phone and pay for minutes. Or, um, you know, also reduces some of the costs that you might have with, like, an endpoint, for example. Um, easier management. Most of these systems actually have like a web management, you know, for example, Trixbox or Asterisk Now. They have some sort of a web interface that anybody can go to. And by anybody, I say somebody with 
some reasonable technical skills can set up the device easily. The management becomes much easier. Whereas in the old days, you'd have a PBX and you, or a key system. You'd go to the management phone and you'd sit down and start typing digits. And you know, 10 minutes later, you'd still be typing digits and you have no clue as to where you are in the menu. Um, also allows for voicemail. You know, some of the some of the systems will actually send an email to you with your voicemail attached. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's convenient for a lot of people. Um, conference bridges. You know, something that nobody could touch because it was really cost prohibitive and very expensive to do a conference bridge. I mean, it, it still is. If you hire it out through a third party, it still is really expensive for the minutes on those conference bridges. Um, and there's lots of other features. Uh, you know, ring groups, uh, least cost routing. Yada yada yada, and th this is primarily focused on some of the asterisk type de deployments that you can do. Um, rapid deployments for new environments. I've actually got a client of ours that um, they went to, to strictly voice over IP because they can get a voice over IP and Ethernet system set up in under 30 days, whereas if they went with separate solutions for the, for the voice system and for the data system, it would take them several months to build out a, a location. Um, let's see, overall reduced cost and ease of management. You know, the, again, the management has a, has a web interface. Oh, let's see. All right, so some of the threats. This phone is tapped, geez. That's pretty scary. But it, it, there's a lack of confidentiality in all of these protocols, all the proprietary protocols that I mentioned, because they're not doing any sort of encryption. Um, allows for eavesdropping, interception, uh, lack of integrity. You got session hijacking that can take place within that, either within the, the call setup or within the actual media itself. I mean, these are, these are two areas in the protocols that have, have uh, been very distinctly separate. Um, where you have, you know, the call setup essentially says, I'm going to make this call to this person. Please initiate this call for me. And says, all right, and now I'm going to set up my media. And the media is the separate channel in which your voice traffic traverses the network. Um, lack of availability, prone to denial of service conditions, just by the fact that it's UDP. I mean, there's no state that's kept on the traffic. Um, but in some cases, that's actually a pro because you don't necessarily want to hear the same same uh, you know three second clip that got dropped in those like ten TCP packets. So uh, yeah, I mean, it it kind of you can kind of go either way on that. But all right, uh, weak protocol stacks. Some of the 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 actual stacks on the phones um, are stacks from pre exploit days. So you know some of the the Smurf attacks or the out of band traffic, not out of band, out of sequence traffic actually kills the phone. Or just throwing traffic at it kills the phone. Um, another thing we have to worry about when we're talking about lack of availability is 911. I mean, you know, the phone system itself is a key critical component to emergency services, so it cannot go down. Um, if it does, you, you know, your users start to actually um, have a, a weakened trust in the system. If they don't trust in the system, they're not going to accept it. If they don't accept it, it's not going to fly. All right, tools. So these are a bunch of tools. Um, Unistimpy is actually a tool that will allow you to go into or go to a Nortel phone and send it a buy message, and the phone will hang up. It's like, wait a minute. Or you can tell it, hey, dial this other party for me. And you're, you're a third party without having to have access to the physical phone. You can tell it to do this stuff. Uh, there's Vomit, voice over misconfigured IP telephony. Um, Cane Enable. Cane Enable, you can actually do an injection or a, you, you, you come in and tell it, hey, I want to be your gateway for the phone. Now, Cane Enable is the gateway and then can record the traffic, um, can record the voice over IP traffic, essentially. Uh, SIP Vicious, VoIP Popper. VoIP Popper allows you to see what uh, VLANs they're using for some of the voice channels. Um, like CDP, for example, on a Cisco switch, CDP is Cisco Discovery Protocol, will tell, hey, the voice VLAN lives on this. So now if you plug into a Cisco switch, you can tell what voice VLAN it's on and then start injecting traffic onto that or basically participate in that voice VLAN. Um, SIP SAC is a 
Swiss Army knife of SIP. So I can go in and forge whatever type of packet header I want and send it along to the phone. And the phone doesn't generally care because it's UDP. Uh, there's no connection entries. There's no state. There's no in authentication. Anyway, um, SIPP, which is actually a, it's meant to be a tester um, of voice servers to see how many simultaneous calls or call channels it can do, call setups it can do. Um, but it works really well for attacking phones because it just sends a lot of traffic. So, uh, RTP inject will inject on that real-time protocol, um, the voice stream essentially, and uh, come along and, well, we'll see. It, come along and insert whatever data you want into that stream. So, so some of the risks. Uh, phone calls getting dropped, telephone booths getting knocked over, just kidding. Endpoints being attacked, rebooted, uh, bogus voice data, forged or intercepted calls, and then loss of confidentiality. And I, I think the forged or intercepted calls would, in my opinion, be even more disturbing than the loss of confidentiality. I mean, loss of confidentiality, yeah, anybody can go into a dry pair and plug in at your you know, DMARC or wherever. But the integrity, if you can start to inject media onto that, that media path, you now could start, you know, essentially doing some sort of corporate espionage on another company. Um, and you have to think about it from that perspective rather than this perspective of, oh, yeah, well, they'll, they'll never figure out that someone else injected on that. All right. Uh, yeah, so some of the main reasons. Lack of secure transport methods. Now, I, I say that, but there actually, 2003, there's RFCs that came out for SIP, S, and SRTP. So it's there, it's on the books, but it's not implemented in anything. Um, by anything, I say asterisk. Asterisk, it's like, oh, go to implement this. You, you have to download this package and then do this. Well, why isn't this built into the software? I mean, essentially, we want to protect against these attacks. It should be built into the software so we can actually test it and deploy it in a production environment without having to worry about things breaking. Um, you know, it's one thing to play with it on your own, but when you're actually going into a production deployment, this, this technology and tools should be built into the software rather than as a third-party add-on. Yeah, lack of good authentication methods. Um, there's no cryptographic hashing that happens when you authenticate to a SIP server or to a you know, voice over IP type server. It's just a, hi, here's my thing, and oh, oh, here's my MD5 signatures. All right, great. How do you know that it's me that, that you're actually talking to? Or how do I know that the gateway is who I, I'm actually talking to? You don't. Uh, now, the, the way to fix that for the, the call setup is TLS, Transport Layer Security, which you, know, you have certificates that you now know that the server is who they're supposed to be. And then you know that kind of brings back to the lack of non-repudiation, yeah. not being able to know who the client is or the server is supposed to be or who they say they, they are. All right, so now I'm, I'm trying to get through this so that you guys can have lunch. Um, we'll go into a, do a, a quick demo here. Inject. All right, so. I'm going to make a call. Mortuary and Steak Shop. All right. How's it going? Doing good. Uh, how was the stocks that you placed last night? They're doing very well, except for this one, but I have advanced information about that. Really? What was that? Uh, don't know if I should say anything about that. It sounds like I'm on speakerphone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is an emergency. Please proceed calmly to the nearest exit. So what I just did was I injected on our phone conversation. So we were having a conversation, talking about whatever, and all of a sudden it's telling me I need to get out of the building? Wait a minute. So... There's other things you can do. Uh, this is an emergency. 
Please proceed calmly to the nearest exit. We'll end that call. Um, there's a couple other voice samples that I put together that maybe would be just better to talk about. But one of them would be, you know, essentially a, hey, there's a hot tip on this stock. Or uh, somebody hearing, you know, from the CEO's type voice, oh, my God, we're going under. I mean, this could be a, la la las uh, a loss of sort of, you know, confidentiality or not confidentiality, but uh, uh, trust in the workers. I mean, the workers, if they hear this on their phones, well, what's true and what's not? So uh, the RTP inject was actually a tool that was demoed at uh, Black Hat last year. So I didn't come up with any of this stuff. I'm just sort of the, the one thinking about, okay, what can I do with this? This is bad stuff. Um, all right. So now the next thing we'll do is we'll actually, uh, do, 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 do I have it here? So I've got this Polycom phone sitting down here. And actually, you want to turn the ringer up on that? It's at the bottom. All right, so what's it doing? What does it say? I'm ringing myself. Oh, it stopped ringing. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Do the, uh, what are the lights on it doing? No, nothing. nothing? Oh, it's locked up. I just locked up the phone. <laughs> this is not a good thing. I mean, again, you know, the, the lack of availability of the network will, will make it so that the users don't trust the system. If the users don't trust and, and understand the system that, that's good, you won't have a good voice deployment. All right. Oh, and the last thing, one final thing. Yeah, calls. All right, this worked before. There we go. They're doing very well, except for this one. But I have advanced information about that. Really? What was that? Uh, I don't know if I should say anything about that. It sounds like I'm on speakerphone. So uh, essentially, I recorded the voice traffic while we were doing that same demo. Um, and this kind of leads back to the fact that this this media is not encrypted. This is actually an automated tool called VoIP Ong that goes through and pulls the the RTP off the network, pulls it into a, a file, and converts it to a wave um, automatically. And then I also have call logs over here as to what was called and who called what and everything. Again, an automated tool. Um, now, this automated tool has to sit in between the the actual endpoint and the server or, or whatnot. But there's plenty of injection tools that will do ARP redirects. So I become the default gateway. Um, all right, so now let's talk about some uh, countermeasures. You could get a dog with a shark fin and the Grim Reaper to sit at your front door of your network and say, out. Oof. Um, some of the things you can do are VLANs. Does anybody know what a VLAN is? All right, virtual local area networks. Uh, 802.1Q. Um, they're logical separations. Now, uh, this in itself is an okay countermeasure, um, but then you also have to do router access control lists. So you have a basically a layer three that it brings it up to, and from that, that restricts who can get onto that network. Um, ideally, the the restriction would be just to what's necessary in that network. Um, I guess kind of one of the reasons I'm doing this talk is is I was working with a client that um, was trying to figure this out, and you know, it, it for them, it's not sort of a, a uh, it's not something that they think about in a day to day, you know, consequences of what could happen if stuff gets attacked because it's their internal network. Who's going to attack? But as an outside party, I go well. 
you can't do this. You've got to be able to separate that traffic. You've got to be able to control and restrict it so nobody can get access to it. Um, you also need quality of service. You know, if the users out there start to hear, you know, either that that sounding uh, klaxon or they don't hear the traffic that they should be hearing because of other network traffic, um, again, they'll start to lose faith in your network. And then another really good control that, you know, actually I got asked, so NAC, isn't that dead yet? Um, I don't think it is. I think it's a really good thing to, to go back and actually start to push for these voice over IP deployments because these endpoints essentially have access to your entire voice LAN. If they have access to your voice LAN, they have access to the data calls, they have access to the data calls, they can do whatever they want. Um, so network access control will allow you to kind of say, all right, only these endpoints are authenticated. Now, maybe the certificate lives on the phone if it's a certificate-based authentication. Um, and there's no password on it, so it's a little bit easier to steal it. But it's a lot harder for someone who has no knowledge of the network to come in and just plug in. Um, uh, and then, it, again, integrating this stuff into asterisks. You know, the secure SIP, TLS, and the secure RTP, SRTP. It, it should just be integrated into the software. I mean, it's been, you know, since 2003. Why is it not there? Probably because they haven't been able to test it well enough. And a lot of the phones are really low-powered, stupid. They can't do a lot of encryption on them, although the, the Polycom comes with that built in. So the, there's also Z-Phone, Phil Zimmerman, his product. Um, Z-Phone and ZRTP, they actually work outside of this whole SIP realm. They just work on the media path. So they exchange keys in the media itself, which is pretty slick. I mean, now you don't have to, you know, you don't have to reverse engineer your SIP protocols or do any sort of... Um, goofiness with that, although you probably do want to encrypt your, your setup, your call setup, which is where you get the SIP TLS. Um, Skype, just kidding. All the encryption is proprietary. It's not open source. People haven't been able to really get a good review of it. So I wouldn't say that Skype is the answer to a lot of this stuff. Yes, it does do encryption, but you know it's across many parties. Uh, so some topologies that I, I felt would be really good to include would be a, a flat network. You know, this is generally how small environments are. It's just a flat network or large enterprise environments that haven't gotten the push to be able to put in new switches and, and upgrade to a newer environment. Um, flat network means that everybody can see everybody else's traffic, even though it's a switched environment. You know, you, you can again do a ARP inject. Um, the other one is a routed network. So this is where I'm talking about changing your architecture where you have the same physical hardware, but a VLAN that separates those two networks. From the, the user's perspective, they can only get to the office server and maybe to the stuff on the VoIP server. And, and that might be you know maybe to check their voicemail or to look at call logs. But it's not to actually set up a call because that, you know again, sort of goes back to the media setup. Um, and then you have a router in between that routes that traffic with access control lists on the router. Uh, and then quality of service. You know, on the switch itself, you want to set up good quality of service uh, items so that your UDP stream for your RTP calls actually gets higher priority um, than your TCP IP, like your email, HTTP, et cetera. Um, and you know, with UDP, you can drop a few packets, packets, but you can't have them arrive late. So that's where some of this quality of service comes into place. Um, TCP, they can come in out of order. It doesn't care. It will reassemble them or re-ask for more packets or whatever um, needs to do. So conclusion, VoIP, voice over IP, little to no security. Um, it's in the RFC, but it's not in the technology that we're using today. Um, great for reducing the cost of business. So I, I actually, to give you a little background, I deployed a Trixbox solution at my office. I've got 20 users on it. It works great. Um, it was way cheaper than any PBX type system. And now I can, you know, make calls from at home and play with people's phones and all that stuff. But, and actually the, the one tool, the tool that rebooted the Polycom over here, um, I did my talk two weeks ago, Thursday night, 
and came in the next morning, and the other guys I was working with said, hey, there's this, this 5060 port open on these two scans that we did last night. And these are two completely different clients that they did the scans for. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Well, go grab SIPSAC and start throwing some headers at it. Oh, okay. One of the guys pulls up the SIPP software and points it at his desk phone. He's like, hey, look at this. Reboots the phone. I'm like, oh, no. So from that perspective, it's, uh, it's interesting to see that there's really not a lot of good security built into these devices. Um, not so good for privacy, availability, or integrity. Um, and it does require, I would say, wholeheartedly, it requires compensating controls. So the router ACLs, the VLANs, you know, uh, it, it requires a, a little bit more complexity in your architecture, but will help reduce that risk and create availability and integrity for your environment. So. All right. So thanks to Layer 1, Evil and Noid for setting this up, NetSpy for bringing me out here, and then HBIC, my wife, head bitch in charge. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you. Go have fun at lunch. Oh, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, man, I was quick. Holy moly. Does anybody have any questions? Seriously. Yeah, all right, so the question is, recommendations for early voice over IP phones that have been brought in to convert them to encryption, right? What other things you can do? So if you can't do encryption, and are these Cisco phones? Anything. Anything. Cisco, okay. If you can't do encryption, again, you know, uh, set up your proper VLANs. Uh, maybe try to do NAC, although if they're older phones, they probably don't do NAC. Um, set them aside so that nobody else can get to them from the network, essentially. Um, and make sure that you're monitoring the ports that they're plugged into. Um, you know, one of the other things you can do is, uh, what is it, uh, port security on like a Cisco, where essentially you lock that port to that Mac. Now, I'm not saying somebody can't come along and put a different Mac on there. That's trivial. But the idea would be that the, the lowest common person would plug in with their, you know, laptop and probably a trigger alarm essentially and shut down that port. So I would say... You know, port controls, VLANs, routed networks. If you can get it off of the data network, that's the best part. And still use the same shared, you know, equipment. That's the hardest part because you don't want to go to management and go, uh, yeah, we need to buy another $6,000 worth of switches. What do you mean? Well, we, you're, you know, all your voice calls are belong to me. Well, they're probably not going to fly with that. So you could, like I said, even if you, if that switch doesn't have a router in it, you could maybe purchase a router or purchase some sort of intermediary device that would route between those networks, maybe even like a PFSense firewall, you know, some sort of open source firewall that will allow you to, to control what has access to that VLAN. Thoughts on a soft phone? Uh, Thoughts on soft phones? question is thoughts on soft phones versus hardware phones mixed environment I would say I mean I would say don't do it just go with the hardware phone because the problem you're gonna have with the soft phone is uh, my calls just dropped I, I don't know what's going on this phone sucks I don't want to use it well what were you doing I was downloading porn wait a minute First of all, you're not supposed to be downloading that on corporate laptops. Second of all, that's eating up your bandwidth, and there's no quality service from your home internet up to us. So I think the soft phones have a purpose, and there's actually, what is it, the Microsoft call gateway that the soft phones connect to that, and then from there it's actually proxied into the SIP environment or into the voice over IP environment. So that reduces your risk because now you can say, all right, these Microsoft servers only have access to my SIP environment. Um, but, you know, you can get in between the, the soft phone path and the Microsoft proxy. Um, I think, what's that? VPN. Yeah, yeah. You could do a VPN between that and that, but 
that might be more compensating controls than somebody's willing to spend. So there's a question back there. No, actually, that's a really good question. So he said last time he played with Asterisk, it was a pain in the butt. And I, I agree. I would absolutely agree. Um, that was about three or four years ago. So, and then now he wants to know, when you do the Asterisk deployment, how does that account for your time in setting it up? Well, there's actually something called Trixbox or Asterisk at Home or Asterisk Now. I don't know. I think there's somebody who works for Digium out here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Asterisk at home became Trixbox. So with Trixbox, it's a self-deployed ISO, which is kind of nice because everything comes pre-installed. But then again, everything comes with default. So you got to go through and change some of that stuff for security. But I can get a deployment up and running. At, actually, I do this at my house. I can get a deployment up and running with Trixbox in about an hour. So it reduces my time quite a bit because it's got good tools for managing like the endpoints, managing the accounts. It's got a web front end to be able to go in and say, all right, add this extension, add this thing, add this thing. I could show it to you actually on the screen here. Um, it's, I, it, I've, I've got it running in a VM over here. Whoops. So Trixbox is actually running right here. So that's the console. No, go away. Sorry. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. You hit the DT button. I did. I hit the DT button. I've got PSI with uh, PGP encryption on it. Um, let me pull up a web browser here. So uh, to answer your question, all right, so now I, the other things I did do is I, I built a wiki for our users because I got a lot of questions. How do I get into my conference bridge? Oh, Christ. I wrote it down and I sent it to you in an email. All right. Fine. But, well, so the central, central documentation and um, how that, that works is critical for user acceptance. Um, if, if they don't have a place to go to look it up or somewhere that they have a cheat sheet for it, they're not going to be able to do it. Um. PASSWRD. Actually, I think the default is PASSW0RD or something. So this is, actually, this is free PBX, which is just, I mean, this is a separate thing in itself that you could install on any asterisk system. And it allows you to have, you know, extensions. And here's how you add users to the system, essentially, which is kind of nice. Um, you got trunks. I mean, there's all this stuff that you can do with it. The, the one thing that I think is really nice is this endpoint manager. So... When I wanted to go set up the phone, I just said, all right, here's the MAC address. And then it goes and looks up the extensions in asterisk in the MySQL database and goes, all right, here you go. Boom, submit, writes it to the TFTP folder. I boot the phone, away you go. So, all right. Other questions? You talked about using VLANs as a security measure. Yeah. Uh, how would you mitigate your So the question is, talked about using VLANs as a, a security measure. How would I mitigate VLAN hopping? So uh, the best way to mitigate VLAN hopping is to get rid of that daisy chain port that's on the back and just say, sorry, you can't use it. Because what you're going to have to do in order to have that port on the back be useful is the switch will have to be able to um, essentially have multiple VLANs come at it. So, or, yeah, essentially. Uh, if you can limit the port to just the VLAN for the voice traffic only and lock down to the MAC address or do network access control, you can then start to only allow traffic from that VLAN for that port. Um, as soon as you start to allow anything to come in on that port, I can start tagging my, ha my packets with that 802.1Q header that is the VLAN that's the voice network. So, and then I just essentially become part of that network. Although it is really nice from the perspective that, you know, the end user could plug whatever device into the back of their phone, it sometimes is a security risk because the phone now has to do the filtering or now does the filtering for the user. Um, and it's actually something you set up in the switch so that if the packet isn't tagged 
like with the voice VLAN, it then gets dumped into the, the internal network VLAN. Um, so again, the best thing to do is just make it so that, that port only goes to that VLAN and then put some sort of NAC on it, if you can, or port access control filtering. So sometimes that can be a, more of a pain, but I thought I saw someone over here. Sure. So the question is, um, new to voice over IP, just wants to know how you could get some of the software to play with it. Um, the easiest thing is probably to just download the VMware image of Trixbox. Um, or I think Asterisk now also has a VMware image. Uh, I, I say Trixbox because the management's pretty easy. The stuff's all there. Um, you got to do a little bit more with the Asterisk now setup. It's not as user friendly, I would say. Um, yeah, you just download it, set it up, you can go to it. I mean, just like this, this is a VMware image right here that I'm running on my laptop and I'm, you know, setting up phones and there's soft phones that you can connect up and all that fun stuff to start playing with it. So, yeah. Any enhancements to security during the provisioning process following your Any enhancement to the provisioning process? So, you're thinking, like, to, to reduce the risk when you actually set the phone up, essentially? There's many you can do. <laughs> that's, the, that's the hardest part. So, you know, you can tell it to use FTP versus TFTP. That might be a little bit more of a security feature, because now you have to authenticate to the, the device. Oh, FTPS, that's right. So, uh, except is that, like, 301 firmware or something? All right, so you could essentially set up a FTPS server. It might be easier to do an SCP, but I think FTPS isn't that TLS with FTP wrapped around it. Yeah, so it might be a little bit harder to deploy an environment unless you have the FTPS server. But if you can do it, that would be a way to mitigate some of that the risk of um, of that getting set up. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You got to generate certificates, though. Yeah, I'm just kidding. That's three commands. No, I know, I know, but if you're not doing self signed. I know, but you, never mind. You got to have a certificate authority set up. So most people don't have a CA set up, or if they, well. Yeah, exactly. But then you got to manage that CA. Remember, there's got to be policies and procedures and ways to make sure someone doesn't have a root CA certificate without a passphrase or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's a, it's a way to do it. But again, it's going to involve some more complexity with it. So anyway. Uh-oh. So the question is, what about the off-the-shelf type systems? Um, do they have any security built into them? Um, off the top of my head, no. I haven't done a lot of research, per se, myself to look into it. Um, the one system that I did work well, actually the two systems that I've worked with, the 3Com and the Nortel, they don't have any security into the, the audio channel or the call setup. Um, and it's, you know, again, it's not something that they think about. Actually, it's not that they don't think about it. It's that clients aren't demanding that that's built in. So as soon as clients start to, uh, to say, hey, this has got to be in here before we'll buy it, then they'll start to actually do that. Um, although uh, with the Nortel solution, I think in one of their next revisions, they were talking about potentially building some of the, the voice channel encryption in. Um, but, you know, it was beta, and they said, oh, we don't want you to try this. It doesn't work. Okay, well, anyway. So. Oh, 
That's very cool. So um, something that he mentions over here is is uh, there's actually what tool is it? Veneer. That's a NAC product that will sit in between or or monitor that that traffic coming off that endpoint and profile it. Uh, or heuristic, it'll it'll look to see if it's a VoIP session or not. If it's not a VoIP session, it'll actually kill the the, tr the port. So that's pretty cool. I mean, that takes the management and reduces your management constraints quite a bit. So makes your deployment a lot easier. Well, I think if there's no further questions. I think uh, go ahead and get some lunch. Thank you.